This is for the Ethics Review class at Parker University. The 11th rule we're going to discuss is informed consent. Informed consent, of course, is a very broad concept where the doctor is expected to advise the patient with enough information for the patient to make an informed decision about the care they receive or don't receive. Of course, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place. Sometimes we think we have communicated something, but we have not done it effectively. For example, I think I'm trying to communicate, or I know I'm trying to communicate with these videos, but I don't really know whether the message is being received because I'm not receiving any feedback. I don't, I'm not able to see you as you watch these videos. Uh, unless I receive comments or questions coming back, I don't know whether my messages have really been understood. Uh, by the person receiving them. Same thing sometimes happens in a doctor's office. The doctor gets into their spiel, their sales pitch about why chiropractic is good and what the alternatives are, and they forget to pay attention to what's the patient really understanding. I think in a lot of offices, the informed consent process looks a lot like this. It's totally confusing and baffling to anybody who doesn't have hours to sit down and understand it. Informed consent is one of the most important things you can do. Uh, the research on malpractice cases is very clear. Patients do not sue doctors that they like. If the doctor takes the time to get good informed consent, it is probable that the patient will like and trust the doctor. And even if a bad result occurs, the patient is less likely to sue the doctor. Many times when malpractice occurs, there is no malpractice lawsuit because the patient likes the doctor. Sometimes, even though doctors have not made a mistake when there's a bad result, there is a malpractice lawsuit because the doctor is not liked by the patient. Now, one of the things about the chiropractic profession is that by and large, your patient satisfaction is much, much higher than the other healthcare professions. So let's talk a little bit about what informed consent is. Some doctors look at informed consent as this is just the process where I sit down and hand the patient a form that says, here's all the things that can go wrong. As long as the patient signs the form, I've got the process completed. Now, don't misunderstand me. That signed form is an important part of your file and your paperwork. But informed consent is much more than just that signed form. This is the opportunity for the chiropractor to explain to the patient what is chiropractic? How can chiropractic help? What is the patient's specific condition? How can it help that specific condition? What are the options for treating that specific condition? It's easy to show why chiropractic should be the first choice when you look at the options. When the options are pharmaceuticals, or surgery, or doing nothing. Chiropractic almost always is going to make the most sense as the first choice. But going through the process of discussing this with the patient helps to build that doctor-patient rapport, which helps to immunize them, immunize the doctors from potential liability. The basis for informed consent or the requirement for informed consent is that patients are free to choose what care they receive or don't receive. But that freedom to choose is meaningless <clears throat> excuse me, unless the patient has enough information to understand the pros and the cons of the treatment they're choosing. It's not just the bad things. Now, disclosing the bad things is part of the process, but part of the process is also disclosing the benefits and the general nature of chiropractic care. It also helps to show the doctors being honest. It helps to establish that trust with the patient when the doctor is willing to disclose that, you know, that it is possible, as remote as it may be, it is possible that we may not get the results that we want, and it is possible that some bad things could happen. And spending a few minutes during one of the first visits builds that doctor-patient rapport. And even if the doctor is rushed through other visits in the future, they will continue to be able to, to rely on that first impression. As I mentioned previously, this is a very important protection from liability because patients don't sue if they like and trust the doctor. 
It also means that the patient has accepted some responsibility. The patient has understood that there is a decision to be made and the patient has made that decision with the guidance of the chiropractor, but the patient has made that decision on their own. So the patient is more likely to take responsibility if there's a bad result. The legal side of this is pretty important as well. If the doctor fails to get informed consent, the doctor has absolute liability. If the bad result, the risk that wasn't disclosed actually occurs, the doctor is always going to be liable. And the only question will be how much are the damages for that risk or that injury. It's kind of frightening to read some of the court opinions on informed consent because as you start reading the opinions, it looks like the doctor did everything right. Doctor performed an appropriate examination, uh, made the right diagnosis, provided the right treatment, applied the treatment properly. But because the doctor failed to disclose a side effect, when that side effect occurs, the doctor is liable for it. So what's the downside to getting informed consent? Why do so many doctors fail to get informed consent? I think there's a couple reasons. One is I, I think they get rushed and they don't want to take the time. You need to evaluate your practice and the number of new patients that you're accepting. Think carefully about how many you can accept and still take the time to spend some time with them to perform an appropriate examination and evaluation and to provide or obtain informed consent from the patient. I also think some doctors fail to get informed consent because they're afraid of it. They think of informed consent as the time that they tell the patient about all the things that can go wrong. And again, that's certainly part of the process, but it should not be the whole process. It's also a time to explain to the patient why this decision, choosing chiropractic, is a good decision. So take the time to do it. And I think once doctors, especially new doctors, obtain informed consent a few times, they're going to find it's not a, the process is not as scary as they might think. They'll also find as they do it that they will get better at it and do it more quickly. Legally, the elements of informed consent that are required for informed consent to be effective include a competent party, disclosure of information and understanding of that information, a voluntary decision by the patient, and authorization by the patient. First element is competence. Generally, in a chiropractic practice, you're not going to have patients who are mentally incompetent. That may happen on a rare occasion, but not often. Most often, the situation is minor children. Be careful when you're treating minor children that you are receiving consent from one of that child's parents. With some of the hybrid families out there, there are step parents that the child may refer to as mom or dad, but be aware that step parents usually do not have authority to consent to health care for their stepchildren. So be careful that you are be dealing with the uh, natural parent of the child. If you aren't, um, be sure you, you, you follow up and, and get consent from the proper person before you proceed with treatment. Of course, the doctor needs to disclose information, both the pros and cons for chiropractic care and the pros and cons for the alternatives to chiropractic care. The patient needs to understand that information, and we'll talk about the elements of, those information, of that information on the next slide. The patient needs to be acting voluntarily. Sometimes people think that's like a black and white decision. It's a yes or no decision, but actually there's a range of characters there. Uh, um, there are some situations where you're truly acting voluntarily. There's no coercion, no manipulation at all. There are other situations where you're being manipulated. For example, if you've ever purchased a new car, most people walk out of the finance office feeling like they just got manipulated and the numbers that the, 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 they signed off on may not have been the numbers they originally expected. That's a situation where you're being manipulated and even though the decision is, is technically voluntary, it really isn't. I think it's important as a doctor that you don't try to manipulate your patients. Your patients need to walk away with the feeling that this was their decision and they were free to make it and free to say no if that's what they chose to do. 
Now, I think if you are a reasonable, trustworthy person, you're going to find very few patients will ever, if any, will ever say no to chiropractic care. It's also important to pay attention to what the patient decides. Sometimes I think doctors get so busy disclosing information that they forget that they're supposed to, at the end of this, ask the patient a question and get the patient's decision about what care they want to receive or not receive. Pay close attention to any limitations the patient may place on their consent. They may prefer low force or no force techniques, or they may prefer high force techniques. There may be some parts of their anatomy that they don't want adjusted. For example, some patients who have had neck surgery do not want adjustments in their cervical region. Make sure you understand exactly what they mean by cervical region and make sure you understand or mark the file clearly so every time you pick it up, you will remember that limitation on consent. It's also important to pay attention to withdrawal of consent. If a patient has the right to approve the care, they also have the right to change their mind. If a patient changes their mind and says, stop, that means stop right then and there. Even if you're all set up to do that cervical adjustment and you're ready to go, the patient says, wait a minute, you need to stop immediately and not proceed forward. Implied consent is a mistake. Some chiropractors have the opinion that because they have a big sign over their door that says chiropractic clinic, that means that anybody who walks under that sign has given their implied consent to chiropractic treatment. That's a mistake. It's not legally recognized and you run into problems with that because not everybody understands chiropractic. Not everybody understands the risk of chiropractic. There are different types of chiropractic. Somebody who's been going to a, a doctor who uses the activator for 20 years may be very surprised if they walk into your clinic and receive a diversified adjustment. That may not be what they think is chiropractic. So it's important to have this discussion with the patients and not just assume that they've given their implied consent to chiropractic care. So let's talk for a minute about the information that needs to be disclosed. And if you think about it, this is pretty common sense. The first is just a general discussion of chiropractic care, what it is, how it works. Uh, certainly as part of that discussion, you should discuss cavitation. Those pops will occur. They're not a big deal. And the patient should not be concerned about it. The doctor should also disclose the material risk inherent in the treatment. Uh, there's different states follow different rules about whether you should disclose based on what a reasonable physician would disclose or based upon what a reasonable patient would want to understand. Uh, my recommendation is to follow both standards. Think about what a typical or reasonable physician would disclose in this situation. And also think about if you were in the patient's shoes, what information would you want to know? The information should also include the probability of those risks occurring. Now, if you think about it for a minute, this is a good thing for chiropractors, because even though some of the consequences can be quite severe, those consequences or the probability of those risks occurring are much, much lower than many things patients do already. Uh, discuss the availability and nature of other treatment options. If pharmaceuticals or surger surgery are an option for the patient's condition, let them know that that's an option. Don't hide it from them. And certainly if you go forward with treating a patient and they're not responding to care, uh, think for a minute about informing them about other options so they can think about it. Now, many times the patient will decide to continue with chiropractic care or choose chiropractic over those options, but you also have to understand that some patients may choose other options. Uh, for some patients, the idea of going to a chiropractor's office three times a week for a number of weeks is not nearly as appealing or as, 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 uh, as problematic as compared to going to a medical doctor and receiving a handful of prescriptions. Also discuss the risk in those options and the probability of those risks occurring. Again, this is a great opportunity to show even though there's risk with chiropractic, they're exceedingly rare. So for example, the risk of stroke from taking a low dose aspirin is much, much higher than the risk of a stroke from a chiropractic adjustment. And last piece of information the doctor should discuss with the patient is what happens if the patient does nothing. 
if the patient is look, looking at these options and, and unable to choose between them. The patient also needs to know what happens if they do nothing to treat their injury and what are the consequences that something bad could happen in the future. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is this case from the Texas Supreme Court. I want to talk about it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is I had the opportunity to watch the videotape of the oral argument in front of the Texas Supreme Court. The reaction of the judges to the chiropractic profession was exceedingly negative. Sometimes I think we fool ourselves because we work around chiropractors, we work around people who support chiropractic, and we think everybody out there in the public must like us except for the medical association. But it's important for you to understand that there's still a lot of people out there who have some prejudices about chiropractic and have negative opinions about chiropractic. And when those people are in decision-making positions, that can have a very bad influence. The other thing I'll tell you about this case is our Texas Supreme Court has been very much oriented to protect the, the medical profession and the healthcare professions. It has been a number of years before this case and several years after this case, Texas Supreme Court has not decided any of their cases in favor of the patient. They always favor the hospital or the doctor or the health care provider. So it was kind of of a, of a surprise to the legal profession to see our Texas Supreme Court making this decision in favor of a patient. And the issue in this case was whether a chiropractor performing cervical adjustments should disclose the risk of a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. In this particular case, everything really went well. The uh, patient sought treatment, the doctor obtained a history, x-ray, and actually even treated the patient on two occasions with no consequence. Because those treatments were not receiving or not providing the relief the doctor expected to occur, the doctor used a more forceful technique on the third visit. The patient immediately experienced blurred vision, all the symptoms of a stroke, the doctor called the ambulance, which took the patient to the hospital. Basically, it looks like the doctor did everything right, but the doctor loses this case because the doctor did not disclose that there was a risk of stroke from cervical adjustments. I think there's been a long-term discussion in the chiropractic profession about whether you should disclose that risk. And I think there's some very good research that says chiropractic cannot cause strokes. But there's also some research that says chiropractic is associated with strokes, and there are certainly some experts who are more than willing to testify that a chiropractic adjustment caused a stroke. So think carefully about disclosing this risk, and, and the language in the Texas Supreme Court was that a reasonable health care provider must disclose the risk that would influence a reasonable patient in deciding whether to undergo treatment. And certainly they decided in this case, even though the risk of stroke might have been very, very small, that risk has such a severe consequence that the patient should be allowed to make the decision whether they're, they're going to run that risk or take that risk uh, to help alleviate their neck pain. Bottom line of this case is remember that many people are still opposed or think negatively about the chiropractic profession and be careful that you disclose potential risk to your patients, even though it may be extremely rare. So why would a patient not follow a doctor's advice? Sometimes the doctor's explanation may not have been adequate, may not have been understood. Uh, the doctor's body language may have been offensive in some way. Perhaps the doctor invaded the patient's personal space or perhaps the doctor lacked the confidence to explain what they were planning to do in a way that uh, uh, helped the patient feel confident in their choice of doctor. It may also be occasionally that the patient is just flat irrational. The patient doesn't understand what the decision is. Now, the correct answer in that case is not to force the patient to receive chiropractic care, but would be to have a guardian appointed. Now, there's county offices that uh, uh, take care of that. So that's not something you would need to take care of yourself, but you may need to notify the Adult Protective Services or other appropriate agency so that they can, they can take steps to protect the patient who truly is irrational. 
It's also possible that a patient may understand the decision and just flat be making a different choice. Now, particularly in our society, because we're bombarded with, with advertising by the pharmaceutical companies, many people think pharmaceuticals are the magic answer to many different things. And as much as we may disagree with that, that's their right to make that decision. A few exceptions to informed consent. Uh, there is an emergency exception if the patient is unconscious. It is implied that the patient would consent to receiving emergency first aid and emergency care. Now, it's not ordinary that a patient would receive or need an emergency chiropractic adjustment, and I would hope that it is exceedingly rare that unconscious patients are being brought into a chiropractic office. So that exception, it, even though it legally exists, it provides very little usefulness for chiropractors. The second legal exception is a therapeutic justification. This is used primarily in mental health counseling. And the rationale is if the counselor explains to the patient, here's what we're trying to do with the counseling, then the counseling will not be effective. So because it will undermine the effectiveness of the treatment, the doctor is not required to get complete informed consent. Uh, the third item or third exception is waiver. The patient can legally waive the right to informed consent. Sometimes patients will just say, you know, doctor, you just do whatever you think is best. Now, although I can tell you that is a legal exception and if the patient signs off on it, you can certainly proceed forward and be legally safe. That should also be a, a, a yellow flag to you that this may be a potential malpractice risk. Essentially, what the patient is communicating to you when they make this waiver is, doctor, I view my responsibility as showing up for the appointments. Everything else is the doctor's responsibility. That means if something goes wrong, the patient is likely to turn to the doctor and say, it must be your fault. You're better off in these cases to get the patient involved in the decision making. And there may be some patients that want to waive informed consent where you just flat may want to use your your better judgment to turn them down as patients and say you would rather work, explain that you would rather work with patients who are a little more concerned and, and more interested in, in their health care than somebody who just wants to delegate all that decision making to the doctor. The last item I have on here is paternalism. And just to be very clear, that is not an exception to informed consent. It's a mindset that many doctors get into. The idea that doctors have is that it's their job to act as parents for the patient, paternalistically for the patient. And that is a mistake. It simply does not exist legally, and it's an excuse for not going through the informed consent process. Do not fall into that trap. Take the time to get to know your patients. Take the time to get a little bit of informed consent. Take the time to communicate with them. Again, first impressions are lasting impressions, especially on those first few visits. Make sure the patient is happy with the care you're providing. Make sure the patient understands what you're doing. If you'll do that, you're much less likely to have problems with malpractice.